Amen. Amen. Well, like any red-blooded American boy, my favorite pastime, one of my favorite pastimes growing up was playing video games. Okay? I, I love to play video games. And video games, they have had a, some changes over the years, to say the least. We've gone from uh, Atari to Sega Genesis to Nintendo uh, to Xbox to PlayStation and who knows what will be in the future. But even though all of these devices, even all of these gaming si uh, systems have had changes over the years since I was a little boy up until now, there is one particular feature that still remains, and that is the reset button. Okay? <laughs> the reset button. Now, every single console, every single uh, gaming system came with a reset button or the capability of restarting or resetting your game. And this came in handy because no matter how bad you were doing in the game, you could have been playing Madden and you were down by three touchdowns in the first quarter alone, you always knew I can reach over and press the reset button. I can always go into my settings and start this game over. No matter how bad I've been doing, no matter how bad the game is, I can always reset and start over. You see, many people love a new year for many different reasons, okay? For different reasons, we love a brand new year. For some of us, it is a feeling of accomplishment. Some of us didn't think we'd be able to make it to 2018. So now that we've seen a new year to us, we feel a sense of accomplishment that I've accomplished something by making it to a brand new year. Other of us, we, we uh, are... Excited about the new year, maybe because of the tax return you're probably going to get uh, coming up. But the main reason why we love a brand new year is because of the reset. The main reason why we love a brand new year is because we now get or we have the ability to start over. Now, obviously, you cannot reset your life. You cannot reset all of your life and start fresh, start anew. But what we say is this year is going to be a better year than last year. There's going to be some changes. Things are going to be different this year. I cannot reset my life, but I can have a better attitude about it. I can have a better approach about it that this year may be better than the previous year. What better time to do that? What better time to implement a new attitude, a new approach to life than with a new year? And so we come up with goals, we come up with visions, we come up with dreams and aspirations of the things that we want to do and what we want to accomplish this year. We call those New Year's resolutions. <laughs> Anybody make some New Year's resolutions? Okay, I don't want to be honest about it, okay. But I know why. <laughs> I know why you don't want to be honest about the New Year's resolutions, okay? What we do is we say this is what we resolve to do this year, whether it's I want to lose weight, I want to get in shape, I want to go back to school or start a new job or start a new relationship, whatever it is, you're saying I am going to make some changes about my life this year. There are some aspects of my life that I am unhappy about, that I am discontent with, I am dissatisfied with. And so with a brand new year, I'm going to make some New Year's resolutions. What I resolve to do and to change about my life. In other words, we want to start over. And even though we cannot reset, it is an opportunity for us to rebuild. It is an opportunity for us to rebuild our life. But it's interesting. The reason why we don't want to admit to New Year's resolutions, it's interesting how quickly our resolve begins to dissolve. Okay? It is interesting how quickly our resolve begins to dissolve. January 1st, gym is packed. <laughs> January 1st, you can't find an open treadmill anywhere, right? <laughs> Everybody shows up January 1 back to the gym with their New Year's resolutions. Come February 1st, uh, 
I may just go out and buy some bigger clothes. <laughs> okay? I, I need to love me for me. I need to learn how to love me as I am. I mean, we began to say, well, maybe next year. It's interesting how our resolve quickly dissolves. We don't stick to the goals or the ambitions or the resolutions that we have made. And it's no different with our spiritual well-being. That is true with our physical well-being, but it is no different with our spiritual well-being. A lot of us in here, we say, well, this year I'm going to pray more. This year I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to come to church more. I'm going to serve more, stress less. This year is going to be different for me spiritually. But sadly and unfortunately, by mid-year, we're going back to status quo back to life as it has always been and having the same results that we've always gotten. We've had the best intentions. We've made a valiant effort toward this, but yet to no avail. So what happens? What happens that causes that? What happens in the time between the resolve and the dissolve? What happens between the time of me saying, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to accomplish, but then me falling away from that and going back to life as it's always been? What happened? Well, simply put, life happens. <laughs> life happens. Things change. Circumstances get turned upside down and life begins to happen. Those interruptions of life we call storms. Now we have some small storms, we have some big storms, we have some major storms, but nonetheless, we have storms. Those are interruptions of life that gets us off track of what we wanted to do. Yeah, in a perfect world, in a perfect environment, you could fulfill and accomplish every single goal you set out to do. But you didn't know that you were going to get sick. You didn't know you were going to lose your job. You didn't know your kids were going to get in trouble in school or you were going to wreck the car or the economy was going to take or a million of things that happens that is beyond your control. You did not know those things were going to happen. You didn't realize life was going to happen to you. And the moment life happened to you, the moment an interruption came to your life, you quickly fell away from what you intended on doing. So because that is going to happen to you, because that is going to happen to me, God wants us to be ready for it. God wants us to be ready for life's interruptions, for when life happens, that it doesn't get us down, it doesn't cause us to fall, but we can remain standing in light of the storms of life that we see. So how do we keep going in a world full of uncertainty? Well, anytime you begin to build anything, right? anytime you begin to build anything, you always start with the first thing. Okay? And the first thing is not the roof. Okay? Before you can put a roof on, you have to put the walls up. And before you can put the walls up, you got to put the frame up. But before you put the frame up or anything else, you must do what? Lay the foundation. <laughs> the very first thing that you must do in order to build anything is to lay the foundation. It is the foundation that, that determines the integrity of what it is that you're building. And so if you are wanting to build your life in 2018, or if you're wanting to rebuild your life in 2018, it's going to take the exact same thing. You first lay a foundation. The foundation of our life is simply who or what we build our life on. So in keeping with our series, The Heart of Worship, today I simply want to take a little time to explain why the heart of worship is also the foundation of our life. The heart of worship is also the foundation of our life. And so if you are ready to build your life in 2018, if you are ready to rebuild your life in 2018 and you want to go beyond the interruptions of life and be more than a conqueror and an overcomer of the storms that come your way, then this message is for you. So I want you to prepare your heart today as we continue in our series, The Heart of Worship, a message that I've simply entitled The Foundation of Worship. 
The foundation of worship. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to our next selection of our greatest hits collection of the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 127. Psalms chapter 127. We'll read the first few verses together. In Psalms 127, it simply says this in verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord builds your house, those who labor do so in vain. He says, unless the Lord guards your city. Unless the Lord is watching over your city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For he, God, gives his beloved sleep. In the Bible, God is described as having a variety of occupations. He's known as a shepherd. He's known as a fisherman. He's known as a farmer, as a vine dresser, as a landlord. As a matter of fact, his actual profession was that of his father. He was a carpenter. Jesus' profession was that of a carpenter, one who builds. And no wonder, because here in our text, we see why that is. Because again, God is described as A builder, one who not only builds, but keeps what he builds. (laughs) He not only builds, but he guarantees his work. See, we like things to be a guarantee to us. Whenever we go out and we buy products, we want that company to guarantee their work. We want that company to guarantee their product. But this is what their guarantee means. If your product breaks... If it malfunctions, if it no longer works, we guarantee that we will repair it or replace it. That's their guarantee. That's the best we can do. Okay. What they do not say is, I guarantee you this product will never break. They can't do that. (laughs) I guarantee you this product will continue to work for you. They can't do it. They cannot make that kind of a guarantee. The best guarantee companies can make, man can make is, if it breaks, if it malfunctions, if it stops working, then we will replace it or we will repair it. But they cannot say, we guarantee it will not break. Well, guess what? God does. God makes a guarantee and he doesn't say, I will replace it if it breaks. I will repair it if it breaks. No, he said, I am guaranteeing you what I build, I will keep. That's why the book of Jews says, and now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before his throne. Because God is guaranteeing in his word that what he builds, he is guaranteed that he will keep. No one can make that guarantee but God. See, this is the reason why we look for brand names when we buy certain things. We buy certain products. We look for brand names because we've learned over the years to trust in these names, to rely on these companies. And so when we look for a truck, maybe you go and you look for a Ford because the slogan of Ford is what? Built for tough. And they will show a Ford, you know, pulling a train up a hill somewhere, right? They will show two tons of rock being dropped in the bed of the truck. And they say, look, this Ford, this truck was built for tough. And so we trust in the name of Ford. Rubbermaid, Rubbermaid, they come out and they say, our product bounces back. And so what they will do is they will show um, a garbage truck uh, backing into uh, a Rubbermaid trash can and denting it in. But when it leaves, that trash can just bounces right back out. And they say, you can trust in the name of Rubbermaid. We are built up and we will bounce back. When I was growing up, there was a watch called Timex. Y'all remember Timex? And they had a slogan that was similar, similar to that. They said Timex. It takes a licking and what? Keeps on ticking. (laughs) It takes a licking and keeps on ticking. And they would show hockey players playing hockey with this Timex watch. 
And somebody take a slap shot at it and they catch it and say, here you go, it's still working. And so we learn to trust in the name of Timex. Well, God says this. God says, if you can trust in the products made with the hands of men, if you can trust in the products made with sinful uh, 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 fallen men, then how much more should you be able to trust in my guarantee with what I have made? Trust in my guarantee and what I am willing to do. See, in advertisement, they call all that puffery. They say that is just an over-exaggeration of their product. But with God, it is not puffery. With God, it is not over-exaggeration. With God, it is objective truth that what God builds, he will also keep. What God builds, he will also make sure it never, ever falls, no matter what comes your way. That is God's promise. That is God's guarantee. But here's the other thing. This is what you need to know. Not only does God guarantee that what he builds will last, but he also guarantees what he doesn't build won't. Okay? <laughs> okay? Now that's a little different. <laughs> go, go, go back to our text. Psalm 127.1. Watch this. He says, unless the Lord builds it, <laughs> they that do, do so in vain. Unless the Lord guards it, they that do stay awake in vain. He is not only saying, I am guaranteeing that what I build will last. He's also saying, I am guaranteeing what I don't build will not last. What I don't build will not last. Now, who could make such a claim like that? I mean, can you imagine if you were building a home, you're going to build a home for your family. And so you walk into Hogan Homes and Mr. Hogan is there himself. He says, look, I am guaranteeing you if you allow me to build your home, that home will last. But I'm also guaranteeing you this. If you go to any other builder, if you go to any other maker, I am guaranteeing you that home will not last. You think, man, that's arrogant of you to say that. That is prideful for you to say that. But yet, that's exactly what God is saying. God is saying, not only am I guaranteed that the house I build will last, I'm also guaranteeing you that the house I don't build won't last. So why would God say that? Why would God make such a claim, such a bold statement, such a guarantee like this? Well, because God knows that eventually you and I, we are going to run into something that is greater than us. Okay? Eventually, in this life, in this world, you and I, we are going to run into something in 2018 that is greater than I. But even though it will be greater than us, God says it's not greater than me. That's why I can make that guarantee. Because it is greater than you, but not greater than me, I can make the guarantee that I will be able to keep everything that I build, and anything that I don't build won't be kept. Jesus said it like this to his disciples in John 16. If you have your Bible still open. In John 16, 33, Jesus spoke these words to his disciples and he said this. These things I have spoken to you that in me, okay? <laughs> these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In me, in Christ Jesus, you may have peace. He says then, in this world, you may have some tribulation, right? That's what your Bible said. <laughs> in this world, you're probably going to have some bad things happen to you. Is that what your Bible says? No, no. He says, in this world, you will have tribulation. In this life, in this year, you will have bad things happen to you. In this life, you will have things that are greater than you that's, happen that's going to happen to you. Some of us, we're going to run into the th things that are greater than our immune system. Greater than our bank account. <laughs> Greater than our positive thinking. Greater than our willpower. You're going to run into something that is greater than you this year. But then he says this. But be of good cheer. 
Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Now, that may not make sense. You say, okay, God, that sounds great for you. You have overcome the world. Kind of sounds like those Geico commercials. Y'all remember Geico? I got some great news. Oh, really? What? What? Well, I just saved a bunch of money switching insurance companies. Well, that's great for you. What does that have to do with me? It kind of sounds like the same thing. God is saying, look, you are going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. Well, that's great for you, Lord, that you've overcome the world, but what does that have to do with me? Go back to verse 33. He says, I am telling you this so that in me you may have peace. In other words, if you hide in me, if you get in me, if you build your life on me, just like I was able to overcome the world, guess what? I will make you an overcomer as well. That's the guarantee. That's the promise God is making. I will make you an overcomer as well because I overcame the world. I overcame everything of the world and I overcame everything that you are going to be faced with in this world, including death itself. If Jesus Christ overcame death itself, please tell me what is it that you are facing that is too hard for God? What are you facing right now that is too hard for God? If your God defeated death, hell, and the grave, if he defeated Satan and sin, if he defeated those things, please tell me what is so great in your life that God cannot handle. Well, I know you can't handle it. (laughs) I know it's too hard for you. I know it overwhelms you. But God says, I'm not talking about you building your life on you. I'm not talking about you building your life on your education, you building your life on your money, you building your life on your pleasure, you building your life on your happiness. I'm talking about you building your life on me, the overcomer. Because if you are willing to do that, I am willing to make you an overcomer as well. So the translation of all this is simply this. You will eventually run into something that is greater than you. It's going to happen. I know you don't like to hear that. You don't want to hear that. I came to church, Pastor, to be encouraged. (laughs) I came to church so I can be encouraged about how I can have the best 2018 I could possibly have. I don't want to hear that some storms are waiting for me. Well, it's the truth. I mean, why would you want to hear the truth? (laughs) Look, just because you are a Christian doesn't mean that you're not going to go through anything. Jesus sent his disciples through a storm. Okay? In this world, you will have tribulation. So I don't do you any favors by holding that back from you. If anything, I am preparing you so that it is not a surprise to you when it happens. That's why James says, don't think it's strange when these things begin to happen. When these fiery darts are, are, are launched at you as though some strange thing happens. It's going to happen. And when you realize and know it and understand and accept it and expect it, you can be ready for it. That is what God is saying. You are going to face some things in this life that's greater than you. But because it's not greater than me, if you would hide your life in me, if you will build your life on me, then I will make you an overcomer as well and you'll be able to stand. Whatever God builds... He intends to keep. So he comes to us and he says, stick with me. Stay with me if you want this peace. Stick with me. Stay with me if you want to live. It's kind of like those movies where we have, you know, the hero, the story. They always come in and they they come to rescue the damsel in distress, right? Like Terminator 2, Arnold Schwarzenegger, he comes in on his his motorcycle and he says, come with me if you want to live, (laughs) right? Come with me if you want to live. That movie with... uh. Tom Hanks, or I'm talking, uh, Tom Cruise and Cameron Diaz, where, where she didn't trust him. He was always coming to sa- save her, rescue her, but she didn't trust him, so she was always fleeing from him. So she, he finally catches up to her and says, look, your chances of survival are here with me, but they are here without me. With me? Without me. With me? <laughs> without me. Well, God comes to us and he says the exact same thing. He says, come with me if you want to live. Stick with me if you want to survive. Stay with me if you want peace. Your chances of remaining uh, and standing even in the test of storms is here with me and here without me. God is saying the exact same thing to us. Verse 2, if you go back to our text, verse 2 of Psalm 127, 
gives us these two approaches that we're going to have. Thank you. Uh, I got one here in my pocket for me. Thank you. (laughs) Verse 2 gives us these two approaches that we're going to have in 2018. Go back to Psalm 127 and watch what he says in verse 2. These two approaches that we have going into this new year. He says, it is vain for you to rise up early and to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows for so he, God, gives his beloved sleep. You know, they say that sleep is a good barometer of your trust in God. Sleep is a good barometer, is a good measuring tool to see how much you truly trust in God. Just ask yourself, how well do I sleep at night? Am I able to sleep at night or do I rise up early trying to face the worries of this world? Do I stay up late at night, wringing my hands, trying to figure out how I'm going to make it, what I'm going to do? Or are you able, do you have the ability to lay your head on your pillow at night and go to sleep? It is a barometer of your trust in God. You know, when they watch these movies, these war movies, you have these two soldiers and they will always say the same thing. They'll say, look, it doesn't make sense for both of us to stay up, so why don't you go to sleep? <laughs> I will stay up and keep watch, and in about two hours or so, I will go to sleep, and you can stay up and watch for us. It doesn't make sense for both of us to stay up and watch. Well, we just found out last week that we serve the God who never sleeps, the God who never slumbers. And so God comes to us, and he says the exact same thing. He says, look, it doesn't make sense for both of us to be up. <laughs> It does not make sense for both of us to be up. So because I never sleep, because I never slumber, and because you can't do anything about it anyway, why don't you go ahead and go to sleep, go to bed, and trust me that I will take care of what I build. That's what God is saying here. He gives sleep. He gives rest to his beloved. So ask yourself, am I going into 2018 worried or am I going into 2018 restful? Because I put my trust, I put my hope, I put my faith in the God who has guaranteed what he builds, he will keep. It is determined by the builder. And it is determined by the foundation that our lives are built on. So how do we do that then? Okay, pastor, you've convinced me. I want to build my life on Jesus Christ. I want to make Jesus Christ the foundation of my life for 2018 and beyond. I want to have this assurance. I want to have this peace. I want to have this confidence. I want to have this guarantee that what God builds, he intends to keep as well. So please tell me now, how do I do that? How do I do that? Okay. Let me first tell you how you don't. (laughs) Go with me to Matthew chapter 7, our last scripture. Matthew chapter 7. Starting in verse 21, and God is first going to tell us how we don't do that. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says this. He gives this warning. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, who talks a good game will enter this rest, will enter this peace, will enter the kingdom of heaven, which is even here on earth now, through the Spirit of God. Not everybody who does that will enter. But watch this. He says, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven, And then he explains what he means. He says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonders in your name? And then I, the Lord, will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Let me first tell you how you don't. Lay Jesus Christ as the foundation of your life. By being religious, okay? (laughs) By being religious. You do not lay the foundation of Jesus Christ 
by being religion, being religious. You do not allow God to build or make your life by doing a bunch of religious stuff. Because that's exactly what they were doing in Matthew 7. Oh, you, you they, they were talking Christianese, right? They were calling Lord, Lord. But he really wasn't their Lord. See, Lord means master. Lord means ruler. Lord means boss. <laughs> so is the Lord truly your Lord? God said it like this. He says, why do you call me Lord? But then you don't do what I say. Why, why, do, why do you do that? <laughs> so either I'm your Lord or I'm not. And if I'm your Lord, then act like it. Begin to do what I say. And if I'm not your Lord, if everything else in this world is your Lord, then call them Lord. Stop calling me Lord. But that's what these people were doing. They were talking a good game. As Jesus said, they honored me with their mouth, but their hearts were far from me. It is not about doing a bunch of activities. Coming to church, well, I'm just going to come to church more. I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to get involved more. I'm going to do all these activities. Well, that's good. That's great. But none of those things will lay the foundation of Jesus Christ in your life. None of them, because they were doing all of those things. You read through Matthew 7, you think, well, God is talking about the world. No, he's not talking about the world. He's talking about church going people. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, because he says they were prophesying. When was the last time you were at HGB and saw somebody prophesying? <laughs> they, they were casting out demons. When was, when was the last time you were at, at Walmart somewhere or the movies and you saw somebody casting out demons? No, no, no. He's talking about things done in church. People who showed up every Sunday of 2018. People who had their Bible in hand. These, he is saying, will not inherit the kingdom of God because it's not about you being religious. It is not about you doing a bunch of religious things. It is about you obeying the word and the will of Almighty God. God says that is how you are to build your life on the rock of Jesus Christ. Notice what he says here in verse 24. He gives us an allegory. He gives us an illustration. He says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, <laughs> please know it is not enough just to hear the word of God. Oh, if I can just get to church, God's going to bless me. Oh, if I can just read a scripture, a scripture a day, or keep the devil away, God's going to bless me. If I can read a scripture a day in 2018, no. It is not enough to simply hear the word of God. The word comes in seed form. That's how the word comes to you. It comes to you in seed form, but it does you absolutely no good until you're ready to plant it, until you're ready to cultivate it, until you're ready to work it out. It does you absolutely no good. That's why the Bible says the enemy will come in like a bird and he will simply snatch that seed from you. Because it comes in seed form. So it's not enough to hear the word. That's why James says, don't deceive yourself. Be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word, deceiving yourself. You are deceived in the thinking because I came to church today. God has to bless me. <laughs> because I came to church today, because I read my Bible today, I'm going to have a, a blessed 2018. You're deceiving yourself. God says, Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The foundation that he built his house, he built his life on, was the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall. Even though the storms of life came to this house, the house did not fall. Why? For it was founded on the rock. However, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be likened to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the wind blew and beat on that house and it fell. 
and great was its fall. Jesus Christ gives the same guarantee that is given in Psalm 127. And that is whatever God builds, he will keep from falling. But whatever he doesn't, won't. Please notice, both of these men, the wise man and the foolish man, heard the word of God. Right? That's what the Bible says. They both heard the word of God. They were both in church. They both read their Bibles. They both heard the word of God. Please also notice, both went through storms. The wise man wasn't wise because he figured out a way to avoid the storms of life. No, no, no. He went through the storm just like the foolish man went through the storm. Okay? Both men went through the trials and tribulations of life. And it was the storm that exposed the quality of the foundation. See, when the day is bright and and the sun is shining and the, the sky is clear, It doesn't matter what you build your life on. (laughs) You can build your life on anything when the conditions are like that. But it's when the storms of life come that you finally realize the quality of the foundation that you built your life on. And since God says the storms are coming, (laughs) either you're in one right now, you just got out of one or you're headed for one. That's, That's us with in every situation, every person in here, that's the situation. You're in one, you just got out of one, or you're headed for one. So because God has already told us the storms are coming, it is by the storm that is going to expose the quality of your foundation. What you have decided to build your life on. The only difference between these two men, the only difference between the wise man and the foolish man was one did what he heard and the other didn't. One did what he heard and the other didn't. You see, we can try to build our lives on many things. We can try and build our life on money. We can try and build our life on pleasure. We can try and build our life on power and prestige or comfort or happiness. I'm just, I just want to be happy and I'm going to do whatever makes me happy. We can build our lives on a lot of things. But God says there's only one thing that has my guarantee. I want you to notice, we're almost done now, but I want you to notice who wrote Psalm 127. Now, the majority of the Psalms, we, we say we know, was written by King David. But David didn't write this one. The Bible says that this Psalm, Psalm 127, was written by Solomon. Okay? And let me remind you who Solomon was. Solomon was the king of Israel. Solomon was the wisest man ever to live. Solomon was the richest, the wealthiest man ever to live. Solomon had pleasure beyond his dreams. The Bible says he had a thousand wives and concubines. So even though Solomon had the power, he was king, had the fame, uh, everybody knew his name and came from all over the world to hear his wisdom. He had the fortune, he, he had the pleasure, he had all of that, but he said, still, let me in, let you in on something. <laughs> unless you're building your life on Jesus Christ, unless you're building your life on God himself, everything else will fail. He says, take it from somebody who knows what they're talking about. Take it from somebody who had it all, who had the fame, who had the fortune, who had the power, who had the pleasure. But yet it was like the grasping of the wind. Vanity, vanity, he says in the book of Ecclesiastes. Even though he had all of those things, he said it was like grasping for the wind. He was not willing to do what he knew to do. God comes to him and he says, I do not want you to marry these foreign women. Because if you marry these foreign women, they're going to turn your heart from me and you're going to begin to worship their gods and that's exactly what happened so he says look take it from me (laughs) take it from me do not try and build your life on money on power on pleasure on anything but Jesus Christ so in 2018 we're done now 2018 there's really only one resolve that you need to make (laughs) There's really only one resolution that you need to be willing to make today. 
And that is to resolve to make Jesus Christ the foundation of your worship. The foundation of what you build your life on. The foundation of what you are living for. The foundation of what gets you out of bed and what causes you and motivates you to do what you're doing. Make sure it is Jesus Christ, your love for him, and the plans and the purposes that he has for you. Make sure in 2018 you are resolving to make Jesus Christ the foundation of your worship. As the old saying goes, that old song says, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Not until you get that in your spirit, into your mind, that it is on Jesus Christ, the solid rock that I stand. All other foundations, all other ground is sinking sand. Until you get that in your, in your spirit, 2018 would be just like 2017, which was just like 2016. But when you finally get this and realize it and you begin to allow God to build his house, God to build your life on the foundation that is greater than you, that is greater than anything you're going to face in this life. Then you will know without a shadow of a doubt, you will have God's guarantee that what he has built, he will keep. Amen. Go ahead, Lord, a hand for his word today, if you will.